This video is sponsored by Wondrium. For nearly 200 years, Sniad had been little more than a pinpoint of light filtered through Earth's most powerful telescopes. Probes sent to the planet's surface indicated a highly hospitable environment, complete with lush landscapes and vibrant oceans. The first humans to set foot on Sniad's surface were tasked with overseeing the production of the firstborn, human life born from biotechnology. This machine-made generation of people became the first sapient inhabitants of Sniad, and within a few generations had established a few large cities across the world. But even before the first human inhabitants arrived, the planet Sniad was already teeming with life. And although Sniad was eerily similar to Earth in some ways, its life forms were unlike anything humans had ever seen before. Strange, double-headed creatures dominated the rolling hills, deserts, and jungles, while giant, jet-propelled beasts swam beneath the ocean's surface. Now, in order to learn more, we'll take a journey across the planet's surface. You, dear traveler, will see Sniad nearly as it appeared to those first human Sniadi residents. We'll see a world that is diverse, beautiful, and completely alien. Welcome to the world of Sniad. For human life, Sniad's atmosphere is almost ideal. Most of its life forms breathe oxygen and expel carbon dioxide just like those on Earth. And like Earth, its surface is covered by saltwater oceans and its land masses have diverse biomes such as deserts, jungles, and tundra. For the most part though, that's where the known similarities end. You'll find unique rolling hills of scrubland, like plains made up of red plants and spiky green shrubs. Elsewhere, you'll find prevalent sproglands, which are open areas of spongy, hole-ridden, moss-like landscapes filled with small organisms and large herbivores, and vast pinnacle ranges made up of cathedral-like formations and symbiotic plant life. All of these diverse biomes are spread across eight main continents and numerous smaller islands. Our first stop in the world of Sniad will bring us to Notor, a continent rich in forests and scrubland, and Glacia, a colder region connected to Notor by a thin bridge of land. Here we find our first prime example of life on Sniad, the Lebanese Cahydron. At two and a half meters in length, the Lebanese Cahydron is a formidable predator. It's no wonder the Sniadi inhabitants refer to them as the Lions of Lebanon. But upon closer inspection, it quickly becomes clear that they're not very much like Earth's lions at all. Let's take a closer look at just what makes life on Sniad so unique, using this cahydron as our example. The Lebanese cahydron fits into a broad category of life on Sniad, loosely referred to as vertebrates. Once again, these terms don't directly correlate to the life we know on Earth, but they're useful in understanding how Sniadi life functions. Perhaps the most striking feature of all of Sniadi's vertebrates are what appear to be two completely independent heads. In reality, the first head, the one we would most readily recognize as such, is actually modified genitalia. In the case of this cahydron, two large, bony shells function to bite and tear their food, but these bony structures don't form a skull, they're actually highly specialized genital sheaths. This means that once a female has gestated within a womb located near the center of their bodies, birth is accomplished by vomiting up their offspring from their first head. Furthermore, as you might have guessed, because the first head actually houses the genitalia, it has no link to the digestive system whatsoever. Instead, once the food has been broken down by the first head, the second head functions to consume it. From here, the food is processed through a digestive system very similar to earthly organisms. Interestingly, with a few notable exceptions, mainly in herbivores, most vertebrates on Sniad have not developed any sort of jaws within their second head, despite its function as the entrance to the digestive system. At first glance, the bones of Sniadi vertebrates also appear very similar to those of life on Earth, but rather than being composed of calcium, these bones are made up of a modified hydrocarbon that actually resembles very dense wood, not only in texture and weight, but also in color. In fact, the bones of Sniadi vertebrates burn readily, making them ideal fuel for fires. Another notable difference is found in Sniadi vertebrates' spinal column. Rather than phalanges and processes for muscles to attach to, these vertebrae have large hollow spaces through which fluid-filled muscles push rather than pull. Sniadi vertebrates' muscle system is unlike anything else that has been discovered previously. On Earth, nearly all vertebrate muscles utilize a pulling function, but here, hydraulic muscles push one bone against another, creating movement. 
Each of these muscles are partitioned in honeycomb-like patterns, making them both flexible and very resistant to damage. They're filled with a kind of hydraulic lymph fluid, supplied by two pairs of reservoirs in the center of their bodies. This unique system makes Sniati vertebrates incredibly strong, and in the case of this cahydron, gives their first head jaws immense crushing power. But that's not to say that what we would consider to be traditional fiber-based muscles are altogether absent from Sniati physiology. In fact, a separate system of fibrous pulling muscles cover these vertebrates' entire bodies, serving to constrict individual hydraulic muscles to generate movement, while also taking on the main role of movement in certain parts of the lower limbs and second head. Vertebrates on Sniad breathe oxygen just like animal life on Earth, though through nostrils located near their armpits, sides, or dorsal region. In species that vocalize, these nostrils also house the vocal cords, forming haunting songs that emanate from both sides of their body. A total of four hearts pump blood through these vertebrates' circulatory system, while a unique oxygenator organ diffuses oxygen directly into the first set of hearts. It is this adaptation that allows the energy-hungry hydraulic muscles to function efficiently. Interestingly, even Sniati veins and arteries undulate to move blood through them. Because of this, some smaller vertebrates have no hearts at all, relying only on their vessels to circulate their blood. Up to this point, we've been able to draw many comparisons to earthly life, and many systems of Sniati physiology share at least some analogous properties. But Sniati life is alien, and nowhere is that fact more apparent than in their nervous system. Though a small amount of somewhat recognizable nerve fibers are present, the main system of transmitting electrical signals in Sniati biology is via a network of nodes and vessels containing a salty, slightly acidic fluid. The more familiar nerve fibers serve to generate impulses locally, while the much more robust system of conductive vessels handles propagation of those signals throughout the entire body. The central controller for these impulses is found in the pectoral region of Sniati vertebrates and is actually made up of two separate organs, one that we would recognize as a brain being made up of dense fibrous nerves. The second organ works in tandem with the first, though very differently. This unique organ is essentially a sac filled with densely convoluted microtubules, glands, and vesicles. Because of its appearance, this little understood organ is referred to as the worm basket. Rather than communicating with each other via electrical impulses, this thick knot of vessels utilizes a series of chemicals and proteins. Though more study is needed to say for certain, it appears that this second organ acts as a kind of endocrine brain. Whether the seat of consciousness is housed in the first brain, the second brain, or a combination of the two will likely be the subject of study for generations to come. Linking this bizarre system to the organism's senses and perception of the outside world are two tiny eyes, located on the first head of our cahydron example. These eyes are solid state and surrounded by an array of heat receptors that allow for a kind of infrared vision. In general, the Sniati organism's sense of smell is divided between receptors in both the first and second head, while taste is reserved for the tongue-like structure of the second. Interestingly, these animals hear through the same structure through which they breathe, under the armpits, and, in some species, under the front feet. Much of the finer details of the biology of life are still unknown, and for many researchers, the joy of learning more about this alien anatomy will likely be the work of a lifetime. With this general overview in mind, however, it's time to see what else Sniad has in store for us. Occasionally, even intrepid alien researchers like us need a little downtime. Sure, you could spend that time by streaming a mind-numbing TV show, or you could spend it discovering a new passion or honing a skill. This video is sponsored by Wondrium, an online platform where you find the answer to everything you've ever wondered about and some things you've never imagined you would wonder about. Their carefully curated collection of short and long-form videos, tutorials, how-tos, travelogues, documentaries, and more is academically comprehensive, thoroughly researched, relentlessly entertaining, and presented by engaging experts. For me, nothing is more rewarding than expanding my knowledge of a particular subject, especially when it's presented in a fun and engaging way. And no platform that I've found does it better than Wondrium. I recently watched a course called Life in Our Universe, presented by Dr. Laird Close. This course covers multiple aspects of one of my all-time favorite subjects, astrobiology. 
In a lesson on the rare Earth hypothesis and the probability of life on other planets, for example, I learned that not only are moon-forming events extremely rare, but a solar system with a large planet in a circular orbit that acts to protect inner planets from collisions, like Jupiter, is also very rare. Paired with the likelihood of an orbit in the habitable zone around an analogous star, there may only be 3 to 30 planets in our galaxy capable of supporting intelligent life as we know it. But if you're like me, your interests are wide and varied. Fortunately, Wondrium adds new content every single month, so finding new and unexpected expected ways to learn and grow couldn't be easier. Just recently, for example, they launched a 10-part series called Discovering West Africa, which takes you on a fascinating journey through Ghana, Senegal, and Cameroon, where you'll meet a mix of local artists, chefs, musicians, entrepreneurs, and sportsmen, all while experiencing what the region has to offer. Plus, you can access Wondrium from just about any streaming device, and you can even download a course to listen to like a podcast. So if you want to check out Wondrium for yourself, now's your chance. They're generously offering my viewers a free trial. Just visit wondrium.com slash thought potato or click the link in the description below to start your free trial today. In the same Notorian plains where we left the Cahydron, we'll find the bipedal heterostomes, a family of animals known for their unique second heads. Among all species in this lineage, the second head is little more than an extremely specialized and muscular tongue which extends from the chest cavity to grip and tear plant matter and then retract to chew it. The most well-known species of heterostome is likely the orca runner. Its stout and agile body and relatively calm demeanor made it the ideal candidate for domestication by early Sniati settlers. Their role in human culture could be roughly thought of as analogous to horses on Earth and, at 2 to 3 meters tall, they dwarf even the largest earthly equestrians. But with so much of Sniad left to see, we can't stay on Notor for long. Now we'll be moving southward, stopping at a small island called Mapag. This particular landmass houses several exclusive species, including a species of the penguin-like Bloombaminiforms. The first and second heads of most Bloombaminiforms have fused together, forming a bizarre face that seems almost humanoid. Bloombamen may not be very graceful on land, but in water, they're fast and agile. The representative of this group on Mapag is the giant armless Bloombamen, a species that has become so adapted to its unique environment that unlike its mostly aquatic relatives, it is much more comfortable on land, and at more than 2 meters tall, it's no wonder where its name comes from. Pictured here is a female, vestigial flippers apparent, and with its offspring held in a unique structure known as a genital sac, a feature of Bloombaminiforms strikingly similar to marsupials of Earth. Mapag is also home to the most bizarre and most disturbing species of what are known as turtiforms, an extremely diverse group so named because of their superficial resemblance to turtles on Earth. Here you'll find Phobicellus molester, or the rape turtle. This species is so named for its method of killing its prey. It will usually jump on top of its victim, oftentimes one of the aforementioned giant bloombamen, puncturing their body with a raspy, skid-like growth housed between its rear legs. In addition, the second head of these aggressive creatures is tough and edged with spikes that allow it to rip and tear flesh. Finally, once their prey is dead, the twin hooks on its first head allow it to grasp the body and pull it to its lair for further consumption. Life on Sniad may be beautiful, but it isn't always pretty. Now, dear traveler, we'll have to leave this small island and continue our journey south to a larger, though still very isolated landmass known as Thalassia. Here, the herbivore niche is dominated by a group of unusual bipeds known as titaniforms. While most Sniadi herbivores feature an extended digestive system within their abdominal cavity, titaniforms house it within the neck of their second head, leading to some very strange body plans. This is perhaps best exemplified in the legendary Magna Dyer, which, at up to 12 meters in length, dominates the Thalassian Plains as its largest organism. The second head extends greatly from the main portion of the body and is supported by the first head, connected by a large sail. The rear of the body, though almost entirely reduced, is strengthened by an enlarged skid. To graze, the legendary Magna Dyer sits on this skid and moves its second head around in a circular pattern. Thalassia is also the only home of the Tromobrachids, a family equally as specialized. In this group, the second heads, sternum, and front legs have fused together to form the only true mouth on all of Sniad, extremely strong and capable of biting, chewing, and swallowing. As a result, the first head, no longer needed for eating in any way, has been reduced only to the functions of observation and mating. 
The 9 meter long C. rex is the giant of this group and the largest predator on Thalassia, found roaming the entire continent in search of prey even as big as the legendary Magnodire. The C. rex's mouth, being composed of a fusion of arms and jaws, can open extraordinarily wide, both vertically and horizontally, crushing its prey in a disturbing embrace. This, combined with the haunting roar emanating from the nostrils on either side of the second head, makes the C. rex a terrifying sight for any observer. Our last stop in Thalassia brings us to the Mono Antichirans, a group notable for their bipedal stance and the pronounced division between the upper and lower mandibles of their first heads. The yellow bounder jaw, for example, features a first head with beak-like adaptations that allow it to care for its young with surprising dexterity. Its name is derived from its leaping method of locomotion, an action facilitated by large legs that contain piston-like hydraulic muscles. Now, our journey takes us eastward, to the slightly larger continent of Acutera, populated primarily by spinostomes. This family of Sniati organisms is set apart by their bristly second heads, which act to blend their food through repeated inversion and eversion. The largest and most well-known example of this group comes in the form of the Red Headbanger, a medium-sized predator that hunts by ambush. Its prey is usually caught by surprise, only to fall to repeated blows from the Headbanger's massive, hatchet-like first head. Alas, dear travelers, our journey must press on. So far, we've covered islands that harbor life found nowhere else on Sniad, largely due to their isolation. The remaining islands, like Midland and Ar, are also teeming with life, but given their proximity to larger continents, share most of the same species. After leaving behind the smaller landmasses in the previous leg of our journey, we've come to our final stop. But don't worry, as the largest landmass on Sniad, the combination of Vesterna to the west and Isterna to the east is home to more species than we could ever hope to cover in a single trip. This was also the place chosen as the largest human settlement on Sniad, now known as the Neo-Mediterranean. Given its size, it's no wonder that most of Sniadi life is found on this landmass. Ironically though, it's here that we'll zoom in to find Sniad's smallest inhabitants. The Picozoans aren't measured in meters, but centimeters or even millimeters. In fact, the average species is smaller than a single centimeter. This diverse and very successful group takes on an ecological role similar to Earth's insects, but the Picozoans can trace their lineage to the same origins as Sniad's largest organisms. These tiny creatures never develop ossified bones, instead relying on intricate muscle systems for support. Their second heads also never develop. Rather, they have an opening through which a portion of their digestive system extends to absorb nutrients from their environment. These diminutive vertebrates owe part of their success to their unique larval stage, which allows the juveniles and adults to occupy different niches, allowing for less competition and greater proliferation. Be careful where you step, because scurrying just beneath the ground here is one such creature, Procerian koyagasiaglu, or more commonly, simply Procerian. This little Procerian, at 5 to 7 centimeters in length, is a typical gigantopicozoan, as they're called, and lives an underground life similar to that of a tiny mole. With its powerful forelimbs, it digs through the soil, consuming anything it comes across with its sensitive head, which doubles as an egg sac. This species prefers to remain underground most of the time, and as a result, it has developed a series of armored scutes on its back to protect itself. In general, the Gigantopicozoan branch includes some remarkable creatures that can grow up to 10 or 20 centimeters in size. Unlike other Picozoans, they retain complete legs and bones, making them appear more like giants than their relatives. Notably, they skip the larval stage that the other Picozoans go through and reproduce through eggs that eventually develop into incredibly small offspring. Now, dear traveler, we'll begin moving a little faster. The world of Sniad is exploding with life, and we have only a small time to see it all. Along the Neo-Mediterranean shores, we might be fortunate enough to catch a glimpse of the Spadehead, a prime example of the snake-like Sprogophidians. These creatures feast on Sprog, a plant-like life form entirely unique to Sniad. The Spadehead, as its name implies, uses its first head for burrowing and has abandoned legs altogether. An even more bizarre legless vertebrate can be found in the Great Azonic Jungle. The pink dandy snake belongs to the Lophophids, a group that, unlike snakes on Earth, is primarily herbivorous. The dandy snake lives its life high in the jungle trees, feasting on fruit and using its highly developed throat sac for sexual displays. 
Nearby, we might catch a glimpse of another Lophophid, but you'll have to pay very close attention to see it. Lepidophis amoni, also known as the tree scab, emerald scab, or aphid snake, is a small species of chitinophidia, a subgroup of creatures that feed on fleshy, bark-like growth shed seasonally by tree-like plants on Sniad. They're 7 to 10 centimeters long and have a tough series of plate-like scales down their back, a rasping second head, and a very strong, muscular traction pad along their belly that makes them difficult to remove from the bark. Interestingly, Lepidophis and other chitinophidians consist of all female populations that give birth without mating, making them especially populous, but on the other hand, very vulnerable to disease. Be careful if you choose to approach. They may look harmless, but they can synthesize an irritating poison from the plant they feed on, which deters most predators and any unwitting visitors. A closely related group retains a snake-like form, but though they've lost their limbs, they also retain the equivalent of front and rear feet. Compared to the Lophophids, this gives the so-called Haplobrachids the distinct advantage of being efficient burrowers. Species like the meter-long hookjaw will lie in wait underground, using its second head, shaped like a common spider-like organism, to attract its prey. In fact, a well-positioned hookjaw may not need to leave its burrow for more than a year. Members of this group subdue their prey with venom that is deadly to local animals, but has hallucinatory side effects on humans. Often, teenagers from the cities of Savannah and Link engage in a practice known as snake riding, deliberately inducing the hookjaw and other related species to bite in order to get a buzz. This is highly discouraged for our passengers, however, as overdoses are known to be fatal. But while some lineages have lost the need for all or part of their limbs, others, like the polydactyls, have uniquely developed up to roughly seven digits on their feet. As our journey takes us through the vast pinnacle ranges of Vesterna, we just might see one such polydactyl, dubbed the Ridge Chameleon. It exhibits clear similarities to chameleons on Earth, and just like a chameleon lashes out its tongue to catch fast-moving prey, the Ridge Chameleon's second head is spring-loaded and ready to strike. Even more interesting, though, is this species' unique ability to shift its shape. Thanks to muscular extensions of its skin, it's able to mold itself to blend in with a variety of environments. Earlier, we discussed the Lebanese Cahydron, a member of the vicious Cahydroniform family. In the oppressive climate of the great Anchoranian desert, we'll find a very close relative roaming the seemingly endless sand dunes. The Spearneck is a pescadont, a group that lacks the extremely strong hydraulic bite of the Cahydroniforms, but is otherwise nearly identical. In order to cope with the harsh desert conditions, the spearneck stores fat in its tail and dissipates heat from its large neck flap. The giant spikes along its first head, so defining for this species, serve a purpose completely unknown to scientists. West of the desert, we'll take a brief excursion across the Sea of Two Lands to visit the Pan Savannah, a large open land dominated by hulking armed herbivores known as the Allotoriforms. This speciose lineage owes its success to their extremely well-developed second heads, which are able to turn even the toughest plant matter into a digestible form. The shingleback is one such beast. The leathery plates along its back, so indicative of its group, have been hardened and developed into a saw-toothed crest above its first head. This alator, small for its lineage at only 4 meters long, lives in family herds of up to 10 individuals. The rear and side spikes are consistent in most individuals, but the size of the head crest varies greatly, with some having barely any while others have a large, almost hindering crest. But in many cases, the larger the crest, the greater the protection from what are arguably Sniad's most fearsome predators, the Feudators. All of Sniad's Feudatoriform species have a formidable weapon attached directly to their pelvis. Among the Sniad population, these disturbing predators are known by many names, many of them less than savory for polite conversation. As Sniadi vertebrates lack genitalia in the pelvic region, Feudators, and to a lesser extent the already discussed Turtiforms, will attack prey by jumping on top of them and repeatedly ramming this specialized weapon directly into the back of their hapless victims. This humping action is propelled by powerful hydraulic muscles in their posterior region, making the Feudators an extremely effective killing machine. One of the more famous species of this group is the Barrel Chest. This powerful and stealthy creature is about 2.5 meters long and 1.5 meters at the shoulder. Like lions on Earth, barrel chests sleep most of the day and hunt in the afternoon. 
their predatory behavior is also like lions, using stealth over endurance, which you might see in other predators like the Cahydroniforms. The act of killing is efficient but cruelly prolonged. The Feudator's attacks are not often immediately fatal, but these predators are patient. Once their prey has expired, the razor-sharp blades on the Feudator's first head make quick, dicing work of the meat, allowing it to be consumed by their flag-like second head. Now, dear traveler, we'll again travel to the east to make our final stop, on land at least. Oroland is the name given to the southern region of Esterna, and its pinnacle ranges are home to a very unique group of vertebrates known as the Magnopsids. As we've discussed, most vertebrate life on Sniad features small eyes surrounded by a field of heat receptors. This infrared vision has reduced the need for their true eyes to develop further, in all groups that is, except for the Magnopsids. At slightly less than a meter long, the Nightmare Hound is a prime example of the oversized eyes unique to this lineage. These eyes are efficient, especially in the dark, but paired with the enlarged pincers on their first head, lends to a disturbing appearance. Doubtless, this is why this timid hunter has been given such an intimidating name. This species also features what is seemingly a third head, in between its first and second. In reality, this long, thin structure is an extension of its reproductive system. And so we've come to the end of our land-based tour. Those of you with an aversion to the deep, dark waters of the Sniadi Ocean may wish to turn back, but rest assured this vessel is as safe as they come. As we descend beneath the waves, you will see many species that, at first glance, may look familiar, but as with all life on Sniad, the creatures here are extremely different than those on Earth. In fact, if you look now, you'll see the looming silhouette of a jet shark. These two-meter-long predators are members of the Jetoseat lineage. The Jetoseats are closely related to all the other animals we've seen so far, but beside the obvious adaptations to water, like fins, their digestive system has been split. One branch of their digestive system has become a jet pump, allowing for a continuous flow of water through their bodies and lending them an incredibly efficient means of propulsion. The other half of their digestive system has been fused with their first head, and through a series of further adaptations has given them the entirely unique ability to eat and begin digesting their food with the first head alone. But though the jet shark is an imposing figure, fear not. Attacks on humans are exceedingly rare. As we move deeper into the depths of this watery wonderland, you may be so fortunate as to see the largest organism on this entire planet, the giant jet whale. These beautiful creatures utilize a jet gut system just like the jet seats, but with some notable improvements. This 40 meter long leviathan represents its lineage known as the cardio seats by featuring a single titanic heart at the end of its propulsive gut. You may notice that unlike whales on earth, the jet whale has no tail fluke. Its propulsion system is capable of huge bursts of speed, but also sustained momentum. Of course, this jet-powered system requires enormous amounts of energy. As a result, the jet whale, and many others in its lineage, are filter feeders. The huge, cavernous beak is perforated with inlets and holes that allow small creatures in and expel water out. Other members of the cardio seats are fast and agile predators. The aptly named torpedo, for example, has multiple hearts along its propulsion system, allowing for impressive speeds. This has made them extremely fast and efficient killing machines. Groups of torpedoes are capable of taking down even the giant jet whale. And at three and a half meters long, they would make quick work of any unfortunate swimmer who might find themselves adrift at sea. But while the jetoseated, cardioseated line might seem pretty straightforward, there are creatures on Sniad who, although clearly jet-propelled swimmers like the jetto seats and cardio seats, bear unique traits that make them impossible to be classified comfortably as members of either group. These are the so-called cardio -cetoids. For the perfect example of these bizarre creatures, we need look no further than the shallow zones of the Sea of Plants. Great Baba Fingos, also known as Chuk, grow to a size of up to 6 meters in length and possess a blend of traits found in cardioceats, jetoceats, and their ancestors. What sets them apart from their relatives is their jointed paddles, which they use to crawl and even manipulate food items. It's unclear if these features are a holdover from an unknown lineage or if they're an advancement seen in relatively recent times, but in any case, it is certainly a hot topic among Sniadi zoologists. These gentle giants lead calm lives, browsing for juicy underwater plants and certain bottom-living animals. They are sluggish swimmers, but they can defend themselves by releasing black, slimy, choking ink from a gland connected to their jet tracks. 
For another example though, we'll need to travel from these warm, shallow waters and deep into the abyss. As we descend, the sunlight gives way to dimness and finally to pitch black darkness. As we turn on the exterior floodlights though, you may be lucky enough to catch Vermicetus abyssimalis, one of the only two species in its group. These strange animals, which can grow up to 5 meters in length, appear to be related to cardioceats but with a few key differences. For one, Vermicetus has a chain of 12 to 16 hearts arranged in a strange pattern unlike any other known creature on Sniad. These hearts seem to function as buoyancy chambers, retaining and expelling water and allowing the animal to maintain its preferred depth without using any kind of jet action to swim. In addition to their unusual hearts, Vermicetids also have a pair of rear fins which are formed from outward puckerings of skin and dermal muscle with no bones inside. This is in contrast to jettocetes and other forms which have more conventional fins. The function of these rear fins is still unknown and much debate surrounds all of these unique features. Given the elusive nature of these creatures, it's possible and perhaps even likely that many other vermicetid species stalk the darkness here. Indeed, like so many other regions on this vast and mysterious planet, the deep sea conceals a myriad of secrets just waiting to be discovered. And so, dear traveler, we now begin our ascent back to the surface of Sniad. I hope that through our journey one thing has been abundantly clear. Life on Sniad may be alien to us, but no matter where you call home, the beauty of nature is never more apparent than when it's seen through new eyes. Sniad itself may be out of reach for most of us, but life on Earth is no less astounding and awe-inspiring than what we've seen here. I'd also like to mention that if you appreciate all the painstaking effort that it took to record Sniad's amazing creatures in detail, be sure to visit CM Kozman's own YouTube channel as well as his Patreon, where you can find even more of these fantastic creatures and even get a sneak peek at his upcoming book. And as always, thanks for watching, and remember, you matter.